Wow, thank you for that reminder of what God has done in our short existence as a church. And to be part of those stories and to have physically witnessed some of those, uh, yeah, it's just humbling that we're, yeah, just to be a part of, uh, of what God's doing in the world. Uh, Christmas Day and New Year's Day, in case you are unaware, those are one gathering Sundays only, 1030, okay? So sleep in, find out what it's like to be part of the lazy 1030 crowd, all right? I don't know how we're going to get the nooners there, but we're going to figure out a way, uh, breakfast, I don't know. Uh, but we will have services at 1030 on Christmas Day as well as New Year's Day. Next Sunday, we're in a normal schedule, so 9, 1030, noon, uh, be here with us. But I know for some of you, perhaps today is your last day to worship on a Sunday at Epic in 2016. And so if this is our last time to, to share with you this year, we, in person anyway, we just want to say Merry Christmas. Uh, safe travels, enjoy your time with family and friends, and we look forward to seeing you back again in early 2017. Uh, I said this on the video, but we have high anticipation for what we think God's up to, and uh, who knows all of, the, all of the things we're unaware of that he might be up to for 2017. So lean in with us. Today, though, we're in the third week of the Advent series. And today, I just want to say that I think God has something on his heart that he wants to share with us. Something I think is on the heart of God that he wants to speak into you and me today and in this Christmas season. But I want to be honest with you, if we aren't careful, it's going to get buried underneath everything else. If we aren't careful what God wants to share from his heart to us, it's going to be buried under flight delays. It's going to be buried under family drama. If we aren't careful, it's going to be covered up by holiday parties and by gift exchanges. And to be honest with you, if we aren't careful, even the Christmas story from the Bible itself could crowd out what God wants to say to us if we are unable to connect the dots. Does that make sense? You're like, how could it? Well, if you read this and you go, that's amazing history. That's awesome that God did that for them, but there's no relevance. There's no connection for your life. Then even being in church and getting into that and clapping for those Christmas productions won't do anything for you regarding what God wants to speak to you. And I've interacted with so many of you this week. I know other things that are going to bury this for you. I know your dad's cancer diagnosis and your own physical health and whether or not you will pass finals and if the deal will get done and if you will get pregnant this next year. I have been in all of those conversations this week. And I'm not asking you to put those on the shelf. I just want you to know that there's something God wants to say to you. He wants to express his heart to you this morning, and I hope that I can convey that in a way that he's wanting me to. So not a lot of principle-based stuff today. Throughout history, there's a question that has been pondered and even hotly debated, and it's this question, who is God for? M meaning, who gets included and to understand in any realm of life who gets included, you have to know this question, what are the conditions for being included? And every single person in this room has assumptions about who gets included in the story of God, which means this. Because we have assumptions about who gets included in God's story, we all have assumptions about whether or not we have been included in that story. We all do. And I think what God wants to speak into our hearts from his heart today is, I want to blow up some of your assumptions about yourself and others. Yeah, I think he just wants to blow some of those things up because one of the things we love most and are surprised by most in the Christmas story itself is who gets included, right? I mean, there are shepherds who aren't allowed in the temple, and yet they're some of the first who get to worship that infant Messiah. And then you have this teenage mom the virgin teenage mom from Nazareth. One day her baby Messiah would grow up and someone would get wind that the Messiah has come from Nazareth and they would say this, can anything good come from Nazareth? Any of you from a hometown like that? They can't believe you've made it. Like you're the, you're the one in San Francisco the rest of your small town's rooting for? 
Can anything good come from Nazareth? And so we're surprised by who gets included in the Christmas story. But then we look at the life of Jesus and we're surprised there as well. I mean, he he invites in a Samaritan woman with a checkered past. Um, He he lets in tax collectors and well-known sinners. He even offers this gift of eternal life to a rich, greedy young man. This man turns it down because he isn't able to displace his own God. He can't imagine having another God. There's a woman who gets caught in the act of adultery and she gets invited in. The only reason Jesus could call those first 12 disciples is because every other rabbi had passed on him. There's a reason they are still fishing. There's a reason they are still tax collectors. Because every other rabbi has not chosen them, so they've got to go do what their father did. But you and I know this. We can read the Christmas story, and we can read the life of Jesus And we can be like, man, I'm just vaguely familiar with these people, but I'm amazed that they were included. Because the reality is you're all too familiar with your story. And you're all too familiar, and I'm all too familiar with why I shouldn't be included. I'm intimately acquainted with my issues. I know my past well. I know what I got right and what I didn't get right. I know what I've done that I shouldn't have done. I know the things that I should have done but didn't do. I know what I've thought. I know the roads that I've traveled down, and so do you. And so that's fine. I can sort of get on board with God having this for them and for her and for him and that sect over there. But does he have it for me? Have I met the conditions And what I want to do, if you have a Bible, is open up to Luke 15. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. We will get one to you. And I just want you to be thinking all morning long about the assumptions you have about the conditions necessary to get in with God. And then, of course, about the assumptions you have about whether or not you're in. Luke 15, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the first two verses while we're still seated. Then I'm going to paraphrase the first part of the story I'm going to share, and then we will stand up and read the end of chapter 15. So Jesus is going to, in Luke 15, tell us three parables. And the reason he's going to tell these three parables is because of what we learn in verses 1 and 2. You need to always go, why did Jesus share this truth with them? And in verses 1 and 2, let's read this so you see the context, so you understand the audience, so you get why he's telling the parables he's telling. Luke just says this about the setting. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So there are two very different kinds of groups present, right? There are the Pharisees, the religious leaders, and there are people that are known, um, similar terms, synonymous terms, tax collectors and sinners. And so there are these two groups present. They're both within earshot of Jesus, and that's why Jesus tells the parables that he tells. He begins by telling a parable about a shepherd who has 100 sheep, and if only one of them runs away, he says that shepherd will leave the 99, and he will go pursue the one lost sheep. He moves on and tells a parable about a woman who had 10 coins, but she loses one of the coins, and he talks about how she would turn the house upside down to be able to find just that one coin. And then he gets into the most famous of the parables in Luke 15. We know it as the parable of the prodigal son. That does a little bit of disservice to the point of the parable. The the parable is about two prodigal sons, one physically close, another very distant. And the way he gets distant is this. The father has two sons. The younger son says to his father, can I have my share of the estate? He wants his inheritance. Crazy enough, in that culture, the father says yes. And so with his pockets loaded, the younger son sets off for a distant country. And and while he's there, he finds himself bankrupt from blowing his father's wealth, and he's in the midst of a severe famine. And the only job that he's able to get, if you think you're having troubles, the only job he's able to get is feeding the pigs, and he's in such a point of desperation that he's now longing to eat the food that the pigs are eating. But no one gave him anything. And he gets this bright idea that, you know what, I no longer meet the conditions to be called a son, but maybe my father will think I'm worthy of being hired as one of his servants. And so he begins that journey back home, and he's just rehearsing the entire time. When I get back, I'm going to say, I know I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but can you just make me one of your hired servants? Because even though I've given up and forfeited ever being a son, at least I will be able to eat again if only he will hire me. 
So he returns. And while he's still a ways off, the father sees him. The father runs to him. That doesn't happen in that culture. The father would have picked up his own robe, likely, and, and have run to the son. And when he gets to the son, the son gives the father what he's been rehearsing all along, right? Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father would have none of it. The father says this back to, not really to the son, but to his servants. They say, he said, quick, go get the best robe in the house. Who has the best robe in the house? In my house, it's the mom, but in this culture, <laughs> in this culture, it's the father. Quick, get a ring, put sandals on his feet, go tell the others to prepare the fattened calf, the thing that we've been waiting till we had a momentous occasion to celebrate. That time for celebration is now. So he throws this party. The son comes into the moment thinking that he's excluded forever. Maybe he could be a hired servant, but he would never be invited back into the main house. And in that moment, the father says, no, I want to throw a party. My son who was dead, he's now alive. My son who was lost, he's found. Now I want to read the rest of the text if you'll stand with me. There were two sons because there were two very different kinds of people in the audience that day. 25 through 32. So there's this party going on for the younger son. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. You may be seated. When you think you've met the necessary conditions to earn your father's love, you can't stand for your brother to receive the same love when he hasn't met those conditions. And remember, there are how many groups present in the audience that day? Two. Two. Now do you understand why there are two brothers in the account? Why there are two children, two sons in this moment? It's because one represents the Pharisees, the other represents the wayward sinners and tax collectors. But I want you to notice something. Not only does the father throw a party for the younger son, he goes out to the older angry brother. And think about what he's doing here. He's leaving the celebration, right? He's not, he's not just the father who, who, who leaves the older brother to go out to the younger son when he sees him in the distance. He's also the father that leaves the younger son's celebration to go and treat the older brother. And he goes to him and he pleads with him, come on in. Remember, this older brother represents the Pharisees. And so this older brother is angry because he hears a party and he's never heard his own party. He's angry because his father's doing something that he thinks is ridiculous for he thinks is ridiculous for his younger brother. He knows that his younger brother hasn't met the conditions whatsoever. And in verse 29, look at something that's incredibly sad. The older brother says to his father, because everyone, remember, has assumptions about what the conditions are, don't we? Every single person in this room has assumptions about what the conditions are. So did the brother. So he says this, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. You never even gave me a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. He says, I've made my entire life about earning your love. And, and I've done so much that I'm the one who deserves the party. You're treating him like he's the good son. Dad, don't you remember? I've never left. I've always been here. I've always done the work you wanted me to do. I've always respected you. I haven't even asked for my inheritance yet. In this culture, the older son would have got two-thirds of the inheritance, by the way. And he's so angry at the grace of his father. 
He's so angry because he's been convinced his entire life that I am going to earn this, and he makes his life about this, but he doesn't have joy. But he has an incredible sense of obligation and duty. Anybody? And he knows that he just keeps putting in day after day. Oh, he hates it. Anybody ever been to that job? He hates it, but he knows it's the right thing. And if he stays with it, eventually there's going to come a day where the father says, you've made it. Here's my love, and here's my blessing, and all of my favor. Let me ask you a question. Which one of these sons is more distant from their father? Now, when it comes to physical proximity, the answer is super easy, isn't it? Ben, one was miles and miles and miles from home. The other, we just read, has never left. The other has done all of the right things. He's been the good son. He's done it without complaining, best we can tell. And the younger son is miles away, but let me ask you this question. Which one of these sons is more distant from the heart of their father? Miles away. Miles away. And this older son just doesn't get it. So I want to ask you, what's the current reality of your distance from the heart of the Father? And before you begin to answer, Ben, I'm at church, what do you think? But before you begin to answer, I'm celebrating Christmas, what do you think? I'm going to remind you of something Isaiah said and Jesus responded to and repeated um, in his life. Isaiah said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. So you may go, but Ben, I'm on leadership here at Epic. Ben, I'm on the staff. Ben, I've been going to church since I was in my mother's womb. I'm not asking you this morning, do you know the right words? I'm asking you this morning, how close or far are you away from the heart of the Father? Some of you are like, Ben, I'm not the emotional type. That's not the point. I'm not not asking about tears, though that's fine. I'm asking how close are you to the heart of the Father? How close are you to the heart of the Father? The Father says to this son something you and I need to lean in and listen in on. Remember, this parable is telling us a truth about God and a truth about us. He says to him in verse 31, You are always with me, and everything I have is yours. Everything I have is yours. The son had spent his entire life working to get what the father had. The son had spent his entire life working hard, doing all of the right things to get what the father had. Remember who's in the audience that day. It's the Pharisees, right? They had banked everything on their performance. They had banked everything on their temple worship. They had banked everything on staying away from all the unclean sinners. And God says, or the father says to the older son, everything I have, it is yours. And Jesus uses this story to tell the Pharisees, um, you who think you've met the conditions aren't guaranteed to be in. And to tell the tax collectors and sinners, you who assume you've been excluded, you've been invited in. There's a place for you. I want you to imagine the pressure it would take off of the older son if he knew he was loved. You guys know what it's like to earn, right? Right? You've been in San Francisco a little while. You know that if you don't bring the goods that, you know, as much as they say they like you, they like you because it's kind of how I treat my staff. It's like, yeah, just keep growing. You're good. He had spent his entire life living with the pressure that everyone in the sense of duty has to live with. Did I do enough today? Did I measure up? Did he notice? Where am I on the list? And you can imagine the thing that he would be really excited about because he wasn't a good, loving brother. The thing he would be really excited about is when it became known to everyone that his younger brother was wasting the father's wealth. Why? Because we love comparison. We love to know that I am at least ahead of you. 
Anybody ever look at someone in the church you're like, man, if they're in God, I know I'm good. We, we love to know when we think we've earned it, we don't always, as we've taught here before, we don't always know where the line is, but as long as we can know that we're closer to the line than someone else is, we like our chances. But imagine the pressure that could have rolled off the shoulders of the older brother if he would have known, hey, your dad doesn't love you because you finally met his approval. You have been approved of because he loves you. And, and, and you're not going to be loved by him because you've finally shown yourself to be special. You are special because you're loved by him. And, and then imagine the kind of humility and gratitude that would have filled the younger son. You see, some of us are trying to do everything right, living with guilt and pressure day after day, sometimes year after year, because we, we want to know, um, okay, God, have I done enough? And will you really love me if I blow it? Let me, tell, let me tell you something. Those of you who've had more success and very little failure in your life, religiously, academically, work-wise, in your marriage, until you've blown it and been loved through it, you'll have to doubt it. Let me say it again. Until you've blown it and been loved through it, you will have to doubt it. We can all say we know what it's like to be loved when we bring our A-game into our marriages, into our friendships, into our relationship with our parents or our children. But you won't know that you're deeply loved until you blow it and make it on the other side. And so this older son, he had lived his entire life never blowing it. He had lived his entire life never missing the mark. He had lived his entire life checking all of the boxes. The younger son was able to check none of them. And my hope would be that we don't know the future. Obviously, it's a story that Jesus tells. My hope would be that pressure would roll off the shoulders of the older one and gratitude would fill the heart of the younger one and they would love each other because they would both realize we haven't met the conditions of our father's love, but we don't have to. I'm going to give you a way to assess some things this morning. Here's, if there's any principle-based stuff, here it is. I didn't leave all of you out. It's the way I learned best too. It's just not time for today. How do you know whether you're living as though God's love for you is conditional or unconditional? Let me give you four kinds of questions to ask. There's multiple questions on each point, but the first one is this. What do you assume about God's love on your best days? Maybe I'm in. What about your worst days? When you lose your temper, when you look at what you shouldn't have, when you do what you shouldn't have. What about your best days? How about your worst days? Your relationship with God, is it more about duty or more about joy? Is it more about have to or more about get to? Grace. There's one way to answer it. How do you live relative to grace? Are you thankful for it? Or do you believe it's not needed in your life? Or do you think it's impossible for you? Because again, you're all too familiar with your story. Why do you follow Jesus? What's your motivation? Do you follow Jesus to gain his approval or because he already loves and approves of you? Now, there's something in the first two parables that actually doesn't show up in this third parable from Jesus. In the first parable, the shepherd loses the sheep. What does he do? He goes out, he pursues him, he searches for him. In the parable of the lost coin, what is the woman who lost the coin? What does she do? She's, she turns it upside down, as best we understand, from the language. But in this parable, the father doesn't go find the son. You're like, Ben, please tell me why. I don't know. But remember, a parable doesn't display 100% of reality. In reality, what happens? For God so loved the world. What Josh read earlier. In reality, for God so loved the world that he pursues it. For God so loved the world. In reality, Galatians 4, 4, and 5, when the fullness of time has come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law that they might become adopted sons and daughters. That, that's the reality of what's happening in that moment. This is what Christmas is all about, right? This baby is going to grow up and meet the conditions necessary. So if someone asks you the questions, do you have to meet the conditions of God to get in on the story and the family of God? The answer is someone does. Someone does. Someone has. 
met the conditions. He's going to grow up and meet the conditions on a suffering cross so that we might have son-father relationships and daughter-father relationships. Remember what the older son heard from his father in the parable? Everything I have is what? We don't believe that. Most of us do not believe that. Most of us have anxiety day after day. Taught on that last week. We have day after day because we don't know if God's going to give us what he has. We just don't know. Is he, is he going to give it to me? I know he gave it to them. I know he's saying this in the parable, but is he going to give it to me? Romans 8.32 says this about God. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Everything I have is yours. But friends, we have to receive what God's made available. The younger son had to come to his senses. The older son had to join in on the party. If you're an older brother in the room this morning, you are not so good that you're entitled to it. If you're a younger brother in the room this morning, come home. Come to your senses. Come home. In each of these parables... There's a point that Jesus makes, especially in the first two, and the point he makes is this. You'll see it at the last verse of, of both parables. He says, I tell you, in the, in, the, in the sheep one, he says, I tell you in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous. In verse 10, he says, in the, lost coin, I tell you in the same way, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So what seems to be obvious is not that the Father's love is available to some of us and it's not available to others of us. What seems to be really clear is that the Father's love is available to all, but there's a turning from where we've been leaning towards and leaning back into the heart of our Father and coming home. There seems to be this idea that there's a party, there's a celebration in heaven, but only for those who return. Only for those who come home. The father withheld nothing from his sons, and he isn't holding out on you either. Let me say that again. The father withheld nothing from his sons, and he isn't holding out on you either. Come home. Not to religious jargon. Not primarily to pray more and read your Bible more. There's a place for that. We will always talk about those things. Come home to the heart of the father. You who've blown it this weekend, you who've blown it this year, you who wondering, thinking you've had your best year, but you don't know if it's enough, it isn't. It doesn't have to be. God has made a way. Jesus met the conditions so that the Father's love could pour into your heart. And all of the walls you think you have up that would block the Father's love from flowing into your heart, Jesus came to obliterate those walls. But you've got to step into it. You've got to step into the party. The father goes and entreats the older son. He's like, you just need to join in. You, you should join in. And when you see the message of God's heart for what it includes, that it would include us because Jesus met the conditions, grace should just overwhelm your heart. And I started it this way, but I know what's going on in your life. I know what's going on in mine. I know the things I'm concerned about. Many of you have told me the things that you're concerned about. And these are massive concerns. There are relational concerns and major health concerns and family concerns and who you have to interact with over the next couple of weeks concerns and will we make it concerns and what does the next year hold and am I going to still be employed and am I going to hit my target? And I, I know all of these things. But God wants you to see and hear his heart for you this morning, his heart for you in this season. What if we could not just with our reading understand what it's like to move from conditional to unconditional love, but what if we could actually experience it? Would you pray with me? What's the distance, best you can surmise, what's the distance between your heart and God's heart? Perhaps you're convinced, even after this talk, that you haven't met the conditions, that you cannot meet the conditions. You're right. You're so right. But I do wonder if, if you really open up yourself and go, God, if this love can be available to younger brothers like in this story, if it can be available to people in prostitution, if it can be available to tax collectors and greedy people, God, perhaps, just perhaps it could be available to me. 
And I just want to, right in this moment, in the Christmas season, just beg you, don't let it get buried under all the other stuff. There's plenty of stuff. I want to give you some time just in this moment. If you've never understood God's heart for you, and today you would say, I finally see that while I can't meet the conditions, Jesus has met the conditions for me, and today I I want to receive Christ. I want to get in on this celebration that the Father's love has made available. If that's you, would you just raise your hand while it's just me looking? I'd love to pray for you just as you step into this relationship with God. And then for others of us, you're so familiar with the Christmas story and maybe even this story. You could have told it better than I can. But do you know it or do you know it? Is it a distant memory or a present reality? How far, how close are you to the heart of God? Let's not blow through this season like many of us probably have already been doing and we're already stressed and the most wonderful time of the year is becoming the most crazy time of the year. God wants to speak into your heart. I want to give you some time to process that this morning. God, I pray that you would speak to the depths of our hearts. Jesus, thank you for this story. Uh, We're just wanting to be enough and we're constantly running into these moments where we aren't. God, we want to follow you and do your will because you love us, not so that maybe you will one day. Thank you for the approval we've been given. God, we want to come home to your heart. We want to return to our Father. Thank you, Jesus, for meeting the conditions and making that possible. We return now in Christ's name.